hockey was, a uh, goalie rather, was my favorite position. I loved being a goalie. I loved the pressure of being part of the team, but being set apart from the team, being the one that was depended on, being the one that if you made the mistake, everybody knew, right? The red light goes on behind you when you make a mistake and everybody yells and screams. Being a goalie allowed me the chance to play with the older kids in the neighborhood since none of them wanted to play goal. I had a friend who lived across the street, and he was also a goalie, and the two of us got to play with our older brothers and their friends as the two goalies in the neighborhood games. But goalie can be a dangerous position without the right equipment. When I first started playing in these games, I used whatever we had. I, used, I had plastic shin guards to protect my legs. I had a baseball catcher's chest protector, a baseball glove, and I had a catcher's mask. These things afforded me some protection, but not nearly enough. And I remember a very happy Christmas when I got a pair of real goalie pads and a real goalie mask. Eventually, with welts on my arms and my thighs becoming too much, I was able to get more of the right equipment, an actual goalie chest protector that came with arm protection, hockey pants that had hard plastic padding for the thighs, and a goalie catching glove that was bigger than a small baseball glove. And with my new and improved mask and helmet combination, I was fearless in the goal. And through the years, as I grew, I updated this equipment as new and better and more protective equipment was invented and became available. I played goalie right up until I was about 36 years old, until my body could no longer recover from the abuse as well as it used to, and you know, I still, still miss it. But the important part of this, it's important to have the right equipment, whether that's for recreation like hockey, or for war, for a soldier, or for the spiritual warfare that we began to talk about last week. Last week we looked at putting on the full armor of God. Let's take another look at what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Amen, indeed. The last time I highlighted, I think maybe I'm too close to the TV, might be the problem. Last time I highlighted that we are in a battle, whether we realize it or not. And that fight is not against flesh and blood, those people who annoy us, that guy going slow in the left lane on the expressway. But it's against cosmic forces, cosmic powers and, and evil forces. And I say again, as I said last week, that sounds like something out of a horror movie. But it's not. It is what we face. And the Apostle Paul so eloquently laid out how we can protect ourselves from our enemy during this fight that we're in. And we looked at three elements of, the, of God's armor last week. The belt of truth. And if we gird ourselves with truth, there is nothing and no opening for the darkness to exploit. The blessed breastplate of righteousness, which guards our heart from the enemy's attempts to poison and twist it. We're protected by the righteousness afforded to us by Christ's blood. And the helmet of salvation defends our minds, Satan's favorite battleground. Amen. 
that small space between our ears. Again, it is Christ's saving, Christ's saving blood and God's grace that shields us from the enemy's whispers and his accusations. And today we'll continue with the other three pieces of armor that Paul lays out for us. The gospel as shoes for our feet, the shield of faith, and the sword of, spirit, of the Spirit. As I mentioned last week, many people who read this passage mistakenly think that Paul is basing these things on what he observes Roman soldiers wearing. But again, Paul, as a former Pharisee and an expert on Old Testament scripture, isn't making an allegorical suggestion for us based on the Romans' equipment, but is instead telling us to don God's own armor, the very armor that God himself wore. God uses this armor in the Old Testament scripture, and each of these items is from God's own equipment bag. So let's continue on. It has shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. You know, in basic training, the one thing that the drill sergeants harped on more than anything else was taking care of our feet. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would bet that there's a good percentage of us who, when in the shower, don't wash our feet. We simply let the soap and the water fall when we wash the rest of us onto our feet. My drill sergeant pointed this out to us, and he demanded that we spend time in the shower washing our feet. Believe it or not, it was something that they harped on. And you'd be surprised how many people don't. After the shower, post-shower, powdering the feet. Clean socks were a must. And a backup pair of socks and more powder in our backpack for when we were done marching. The minute we were done, take off your boots, take off your socks, powder your feet, fresh socks, put your boots back on. The most time spent when we received our uniforms was when they fitted us for our boots. The correct fit was essential. So what does Paul mean by, and as shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace? What does it mean to have ready feet? We don't get very far walking in bare feet, especially on rough terrain or sharp glass or stones. And forget about trying to wage a war on that type of terrain in our bare feet. For this reason, we must have proper footwear. And if, we are, if we are to follow the command of our general, follow the great commission given to us by Jesus to go and make disciples of all the world. Amen. And if we are to bring the gospel to others, we must be ready to suffer hardship for the sake of that gospel. We must not be stopped by blisters and wounds we suffer when we encounter opposition. We mustn't allow the terrain, the rocks, the glass, to stop us, which they would if we were barefoot. Amen. The proper footwear will protect our feet and keep them ready. And again, this image of shoes on ready feet that Paul uses does not come from observing the sandals worn by the Roman soldiers. Instead, the picture stems from the ancient scriptures that Paul knew so well. Isaiah 52, 7 may clarify what Paul meant when he wrote of putting on the readiness of the gospel as uh, the gospel of peace as shoes. And it says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Amen. If this is what Paul had in mind when he wrote when he wrote this, then it's clear that Paul is exhorting us to always be ready to share the good news. That we must always be prepared with good shoes on our feet to carry the gospel far and wide and share it with everyone. Isaiah 52, 8 follows that with a description of the watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem launching into songs of joy upon hearing the good news. These guards who were always ready and on the lookout for the approach of their enemies now sing with joy that God has delivered them. In Ephesians, Paul is applying this same idea 
to us sharing the gospel of peace with those whose hearts are longing to hear it. Beautiful are the feet that bring the good news. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The flaming darts of the evil one. Now, as I mentioned last week, the devil loves to whisper in our ears. His number one attack is, did God really say? When he tempted Adam and Eve, it wasn't about fruit. It was about the word of God. When Abraham was following God's command to sacrifice Isaac, I'm sure in his head the enemy was whispering, did God really say to sacrifice your son? But those flaming arrows can be deflected away or extinguished. In ancient times, shields were huge things capable of protecting you from head to foot. They were usually made of wood covered in leather, and soldiers would dip them in water and soak the leather, and when the enemy fired flaming arrows at them, these arrows would be extinguished by the wet leather. So what is the shield of faith? First, it's important to define faith. Webster defined faith, defines faith as devotion to, or do, devotion to duty or to a person. Loyalty. The quality of keeping one's promises. Belief and trust in and loyalty to God. Belief in the doctrines of a religion. Firm belief even with the absence of proof. Complete confidence. The biblical definition of faith is a little different. The ESV translation of Hebrews 11.1 1 describes faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The King James translation says it this way, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things, the evidence of things. Defined this way, faith has deep implications because substance is tangible and evidence is proof. So then faith, by definition, is not some misty, murky emotion without any grounding in reality. It is substantive, tangible proof. It is real. But how does our faith protect us like a shield? Well, it doesn't. But the one in whom we put our faith does. And once again, we have to look to Paul's expertise, expertise excuse me, in the Old Testament for an explanation of the shield of faith. The Old Testament, again, brings clarity to Paul's words that he writes in Ephesians. Paul is not saying that faith in and of itself has some magical defensive power to protect us. Instead, what he is saying is that faith protects us from the enemy's attacks because our faith takes on the power and the protection of God himself. Repeatedly in the Old Testament, it is God, not faith, who is described again and again as our shield. In Genesis 15, 1, the Lord tells Abraham, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Proverbs 30, Proverbs 30 uh, chap, uh, chapter 30, verse 5 says, He, God, is a shield to all who come to him for protection. God is our shield and our refuge. God is our hiding place when the difficulties come. God's faithfulness will keep us safe when the enemy launches his arrows our way. And about God's protection, Psalm 91 says this, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Thousands may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. 
you will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. And when I read this, I have to admit, I had no idea what a buckler was. I had to look it up. It turns out that a buckler is a small, round shield worn on your forearm. So God is our refuge. He is our shield. And as I mentioned, shield back then, a full-size shield was a huge thing. But he's also our buckler, the small shield used to ward off closer enemies. And so faith becomes our shield in Paul's imagery because it is, by, it is the means by which we flee to God for refuge from the enemy's attacks. And then we come to the sword of the Spirit. Last but certainly not least. And why then does Paul list it last? He lists it last because without having put on the rest of God's armor, no one can use the sword of the Spirit the way God intended, nor can anyone wield it victoriously. Throughout history, there are people, both real and fictional, whose identity is tied to their weapon. James Bond and his Walther PPK, Dirty Harry and his Magnum 44, Robin Hood and his bow and arrows, Thor and his hammer, the Jedi Knights and their lightsabers, Zorro and his sword, Captain America and his shield, Indiana Jones and his whip, King Arthur and Excalibur. The sword is the only item that Paul lists that's for offense. The others are defensive. The others are defensive, designed to protect us. And even if we're equipped with all the other pieces, even if we're equipped with all the other pieces of God's armor, without our sword, we are little more than heavily armored ducks in a shooting gallery. While the rest of the armor is vitally important, it's only the sword that allows us to attack our enemy, to do the work that needs to be done to drive him away. Maybe that's why we remember King Arthur and Excalibur, his famous sword. We don't remember his helmet or his breastplate, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. As with any weapon, we must know how to use it correctly so as not to injure ourselves or others. Too often, the Word of God is used by so-called believers as a bludgeon. They conveniently take Scripture out of context and bend it to mean what they want it to mean so that they can beat up on other people with it. This argument rages in our country today, and without turning this into a political debate, there's a difference between using a weapon for its correct purpose and abusing that purpose. Those that use Scripture for their own ends are the spiritual version of these people who are shooting up our schools and our churches and the like. But this is not the way a well-trained soldier of Christ uses the sword. Paul says the sword of the Spirit is the Word of of God. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word, scripture, the Holy Bible is illuminating. It lights the darkness. It reveals all, both good and bad. So why does Paul liken it to a sword? The writer of Hebrews, which may have been Paul, puts it this way in Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of 
the heart. The invincible sword of the living God. His sword is able to cut through every defense that Satan and his minions can raise. When wielded by a servant of God, nothing can withstand its ability to cut straight through soul, spirit, joint, bone, and marrow and uncover the truth. It is our duty as soldiers in God's army to use his word to discern the truth and then follow it. As I quoted last week, 2 Corinthians 10 tells us when God's word reveals something wrong in ourselves, we can use this spiritual weapon to remove the offending thoughts and strongholds. And unlike the other pieces of God's armor, which are solely defensive, the sword is uniquely suited to be used both offensively and defensively. And we see in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus spent 40 days in the desert and was tempted by Satan, he used God's word, the sword of the Spirit, as his defense, as well as offense. He expertly parried Satan's attacks and countered them with Scripture. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. How many people, when you're hungry, right? They have a new term for that, right? Hangry, right? I'm, I'm hungry and I'm angry because I'm, I'm angry because I'm hungry, right? How many people in those kind of situations, when you're already put low, when you're hungry, can deflect those attacks on your own? Those are the times, right, when we yell at our kids, when we yell at our wife, when Things like that happen when we're, brought, when we're low, whether that's hungry or hangry or whatever is going on that we can't defend by ourselves. And this is why God gives us these weapons. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him. And I can imagine the devil running away with his proverbial tail between his legs licking his wounds that Jesus had afflicted upon him with the sword of the Spirit. Jesus shows us how to use the sword correctly. As soldiers of Christ, the sword used correctly is the only weapon we have to complete the work he has given us to do. But again, why a sword? Why does God supply us with a sword while the enemy has arrows? The enemy fights from long distance, but swords are for close combat. This is a clue to the nature of the battle that a Christian must wage. We cannot do what Jesus has commanded us to do from long range. We must get down and dirty with those that we are bringing the gospel to. We must meet them in the muck where they are at. It's close quarter combat. If we keep our distance, our weapon is useless. But remember, to keep your sword sharp at all times. A sword will dull over time, and it doesn't sharpen itself. Get out the whetstone and sharpen away. Get in the Word. Keep your sword sharp. Keep in your Bible. Once again, Paul draws the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God from the Old Testament Scriptures. Isaiah 49, 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword sword. This means the Lord was preparing his servant to come as a warrior with sharp words of judgment. But Israel wasn't fit to be his servant, so God sent a different servant. 
And when Jesus came the first time, he could have come, he could have done so with judgment. He could have come to condemn. Instead, he came humbly to seek and save the lost. He set his followers on the same mission, to seek the lost and lead them to him. In his second coming, the book of Revelation says that Jesus will return as a warrior riding on the clouds on a white horse with a sharp sword coming from his mouth to judge all the nations. That sword will be the word of God from which he will judge. And that, my friends, will be a bad day for those who have rejected him. And so, Christian soldier, with your helmet of salvation protecting you from Satan's attacks on your mind, with the breastplate of righteousness protecting your heart from being twisted by the enemy's lies, with the belt of truth girding you, with ready feet shod with the gospel, with the shield of faith faith defending you with the power of God from the flaming arrows and with the sword of the Spirit, His very word, cutting through any argument or attack launched at you, I urge you to take up your mission. Go out and make disciples of all the world. And if you wear God's own armor and carry His sword, you are better protected than any soldier has ever been. And though thousands may fall in battle all around you, as it says in Psalm 91, you will stand and will not fall. Most importantly, remember that despite having to continue fighting against a vanquished enemy, the war is actually over. Jesus delivered the winning blow on Calvary. So with all that protection and the confidence that we are already victorious, go out and bring more people to the victory party. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us the tools to work with, the sword, I'm, I'm just, I'm blown away that the very, the very way that you describe yourself, you give these things to us to use as our protection, that you are there for us, that we are under your protection. You are our shield and our buckler, and your word is our sword. And may we be ready with ready feet to spread the gospel. May we put those shoes on and walk far and wide over all terrain to get your, the word of your good news out. We're so thankful for your son and his sacrifice. His blood makes us righteous in your eyes. It gives us the right to wear that breastplate of righteousness and that helmet of salvation. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.